Good evening, my dear friends and colleagues. Today we will talk about one of the most severe forms of glomerular fracture, which is anti-glomerular basement membrane disease and good pasture disease. This is our agenda. The syndrome of renal failure and lung hemorrhage was associated with the name of Good Pasture, Ernest Good Pasture, as described by Stanton and Tange in their description of nine cases in 1958. All these nine cases presented by lung hemorrhage and acute renal failure, which was very similar uh, to the presentation of a young man who was reported by Good Pasture himself in 1919 by lung hemorrhage and renal failure. Nowadays, many diseases have been described or associated by alveolar hemorrhage and rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. Now we will talk about the definitions of these uh, syndromes. The first one is pulmonary renal syndrome, pulmonary renal syndrome, which describes renal failure and respiratory failure. We'll discuss the causes later on. The second term is good pasture syndrome, good pasture syndrome, which include conditions with RBGM and alveolar hemorrhage, and we'll discuss the causes later on on the PowerPoint. The third term is anti-glomerular basement membrane disease. In this disease is associated with antibodies from the name anti-GBM, antibodies against components of the glomerular basement membrane. The most the most common or the most important cause is good pasture disease and Albert syndrome post transplant anti-GBM. Anti-GBM disease include uh, antibodies against components or any component of the GBM. It include good pasture disease and anti-GBM disease following transplantation to Alport syndrome. And what about good pasture disease, not syndrome disease? Good pasture disease is associated with antibodies specific, very specific to the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen of the glomerular basement membrane. Very specific. Good pasture disease is associated with antibodies. Antibodies specific for the alpha-3 chain of, of type 4 collagen of the glomerular basement membrane. Albert syndrome post-transplant anti-GBM disease is associated with anti-GBM antibodies that develop after renal transplantation in, in patients with Albert syndrome. In Albert syndrome. These terms are very important. Pulmonary renal syndrome, good pasture syndrome, anti-GBM disease, and good pasture disease. Now we'll talk about the etiology and pathogenesis. The most important is the autoimmunity, is the autoimmunity. Good pasture disease, as we just said, is caused by autoimmunity or autoantibodies to the carboxyl terminal non-collagenous domain of type 4, type 4 collagen, alpha-3 chain, to the alpha-3 chain of type 4 collagen. This is the most important. This is the main pathogenesis. Type 4 collagen is, is an essential component of all basement membranes. It is composed of trimers composing two alpha, two alpha 1 and one alpha 2. And there, all, there are also four tissue-specific chains, alpha 3, 
alpha 4, alpha 5, alpha 6. Three of these, alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5, are present in the glomerular basement membrane, as well as in the basement membrane of alveoli, cochlea, and parts of the eye. Again, the most important pathogenesis of good pasture disease is antibodies against alpha-3 type 4 collagen. What about the predisposing factors for good pasture disease? Environmental and genetic factors are implicated. There are strong associations between good pasture disease and HLA class 2 alleles especially DRP115, DRB115, and DR4. This is very important. A very strong association between good pasture disease and DRB115. What about the precipitating factors? No, no specific infectious agents have been consistently identified but hydro hydroxycarbon exposure or hydrocarbon exposure has been linked in many cases as a precipitating factor for the appearance of good pasture disease and the most important one is cigarette smoking cigarette smoking may precipitate lung hemorrhage in patient who already have circulating autoantibodies also, in many cases, renal trauma or inflammation has preceded the development of disease. But the most important precipitating factor is cigarette smoking followed by hydrocarbon exposure. This is a summary of what we said. The predisposing events associated with the presentation of good pasture disease some predisposing events that induce the autoimmune response, which include smooth vessel vasculitis, membranous nephropathy, lithotripsy of renal syndromes, urinary obstruction, alimtuzumab therapy for MS, or predisposing factors that precipitate pulmonary hemorrhage, as we said, the most important is cigarette smoking, hydrocarbon exposure, pulmonary infections, and fluid overload. About the epidemiology, good pasture disease is a rare condition with an incidence of around one case per million per year. The incidence in black population is lower. There is a slight male predominance. Lung hemorrhage usually is more common in younger patients, and the, the disease incidence is bimodal with peaks in the third, the third and six decay. What about the clinical manifestations? 50 to 75 percent of patients present with acute lung hemorrhage and acute renal failure. This is the most common presentations, lung hemorrhage and acute renal failure. And usually these symptoms is characterized by very rapid progression during days and in some cases it may take a more prolonged course. Lack of systemic symptoms is typical but again the most important manifestation or the most important presentation is acute lung hemorrhage and acute renal failure. Let's talk about the lung hemorrhage in details. Lung hemorrhage can occur with the renal disease or isolated lung hemorrhage. The main symptoms are cough and hemopsis. This lung hemorrhage can result in marked iron deficiency anemia, can cause dyspnea, even in the absence of hemopsis. Examination usually reveal pallor, respiratory cackles, signs of consolidation, and finally, respiratory distress. The most sensitive indicator of recent lung hemorrhage 
is increased uptake of inhaled carbon monoxide and this is a question the most sensitive indicator of recent lung hemorrhage is increased uptake of inhaled carbon monoxide young hemorrhage usually occur with current cigarette smokers as we said before the most important predisposing factor for lung hemorrhage is cigarette smoking what about the glomerulonephritis patients with glomerulonephritis usually present with dark or red urine and progress to oliguria and about third to half percent of patients glomerulonephritis can occur isolated without lung hemorrhage without lung hemorrhage deterioration of renal function is usually very rapid is usually very rapid and one of the most common causes of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis is Godbusher disease urine analysis usually revealed hematuria even in isolated pulmonary disease there is usual hematuria modest proteinuria dysmorphic rbc's and rbc's cast on microscopy the kidneys due to the acute condition are generally of normal size and can be enlarged due to active inflammation what about the pathology in the light microscopy renal biopsy is essential is essential because it provides diagnostic and prognostic values the typical appearance of course is diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis with variable degree of necrosis and decrescent formation one of the most important causes of crescentic glomerulonephritis is Godbusher disease so in light microscopy the most important finding is diffuse proliferative gn with crescentic crescentic formation the degree of crescent formation and tubular loss correlates with the renal prognosis it is the most important item to assess the prognostic or the prognosis of the patient is the crescent and ex its extent usually the crescents are of similar age and cellularity this is a picture of the crescent in the Bowman's space was collapse of the glomerular tuft cellular crescent by immune fluorescence or immune histochemistry there is characteristic linear deposition linear deposition this is very important linear deposition of immunoglobulin along the glomerular basement membrane and the immunoglobulin is usually IgG linear deposition along the GBM very characteristic sometimes in 10 to 15 percent it can be with IgA or IgM and really IgA is detected linear deposition also of C3 is detectable in about 70 percent of cases so there is characteristic linear deposition of immunoglobulin plus or minus complement this linear deposition is not pathognomonic for good busture disease it can occur with other conditions what are the causes of this linear binding or linear deposition this is a very common question and for differential diagnosis causes of linear deposition of immunoglobulins in the biopsy or uh, the GBM can be specific binding to the glomerular basement membrane like in Goodbuster syndrome and Albert syndrome after renal transplantation or non-specific binding like very important diabetes fibrillary cadaveric kidneys light chain disease and systemic lupus the most important is diabetes 
and fibrillary glomerulopathy or fibrillary glomerular fracts. This is causes of linear deposition of immunoglobulins. Very common question. This is the picture of the linear deposition. Takes the line of the glomerular basement membrane. As you are uh, drawing it with a pencil. Very characteristic. What about the laboratory findings in the serum? Circulating anti-GBM antibodies are almost invariably present in all patients, can be detected and quantified. The titre of these antibodies, of the anti-GBM antibodies, correlate with the severity of the nephritis. Treatment and relapse are often mirrored by change in the titre. So we can use, we will use the titr during treatment of the patient to assess the response. These antibodies, anti-GBM antibodies, test can give us false positive and false negative results. False positive result can be present in patient with other inflammatory diseases and it can give us false negative that the patient has good posture disease but the test is negative in patient with some patient with isolated lung disease or in the very early or subacute renal disease the test can be very low a very important condition is the presence of a double positivity, double positivity, positive patient with anti-GBM antibodies and ANCA antibodies, anti-neutrophilic cytoplasmic antibody, patient with double positive antibodies, anti-GBM and ANCA antibodies, especially myeloperoxidase antibody. These double positive patients usually have a clinical course and response treatment more typical to the vasculitis than, than of good posture disease. So the clinical picture and the treatment response is usually similar to the ANCA associated vasculitis course. Anti-GBM antibodies tend to be lower in these double positive patients. Recovery, recovery of the renal function tend to be more likely in these double positive patients. They have a better prognosis than anti-GBM, uh, good posture disease with only positive anti-GBM antibodies. So the conclusion here is that these double positive patients have a clinical course and treatment response similar to vasculitis rather than good posture disease and the renal recovery is much more common in these double positive patients better prognosis than good posture disease now we'll talk about the differential diagnosis First, we'll talk about the non-immune causes or what we have said in the first two slides in the definition slide, pulmonary causes of pulmonary renal syndromes. Causes of pulmonary renal syndrome, which is associated with renal failure and respiratory failure. It is subclassified to conditions with pulmonary edema like an acute kidney injury with hypervolemia, very common condition. We have a patient with acute uh, renal failure or acute kidney injury with oliguria and then hypervolemia or in patient with severe heart failure. It have both AKI and renal uh, or uh, respiratory failure. Or 
infections like in severe bacterial pneumonia, hantavirus infection, or opportunistic infections in immunocompromised patient causing multiple organ failure. Again, acute respiratory distress syndrome with renal failure in multi-organ failure, baraquate poisoning, or in patients with renal vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli. These are the causes of pulmonary renal syndrome, non-immune causes. Now we'll talk about causes of lung hemorrhage and RBGN, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, a very important entity in our clinical practice very common presentation you should know your differential diagnosis one of the most important is our talk today is antibodies to the anti-gbn disease representing about 20 to 40 percent of cases which is a good pasture disease and the other 60 to 80 percent is the presence of systemic vasculitis the most common is Wagner granulomatosis or granulomatosis with polyangitis or the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis or church strauss microscopic polyangitis of course systemic lupus erythematosus one of the most common causes of these lung hemorrhage and the RBGN IgA vasculitis Henochshon line Bessit mixed cryoglobulinemia rheumatoid vasculitis and drugs like penicillamine hydralazine and propyl cyrosine. The most important causes are good pasture disease, Wagner, Church of Strauss, lupus, microscopic polyangitis. Very important slide in our clinical practice. Now we'll talk about diagnosis and treatment and we will talk mainly from the key DIGO guidelines 2020. Kidigo 2020 said about the diagnosis that the diagnosis of anti GBM should be made very urgently, very urgently in all patients with suspected RBGM. So, any patient coming to you presented by rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, we should ask immediately for anti glomerular basement membrane antibodies. Again, this is a clarification. We should ask for it urgently. These antibodies may be negative in up to 10% of patients. And then in these cases, the diagnosis is only made by kidney biopsy demonstrating the linear IgG deposition along the glomerular basement membrane. Lung hemorrhage, lung hemorrhage is usually most commonly in our clinical practice is diagnosed by high resolution CT. This is the practice. When a patient was suspected dyspnea or lung hemorrhage, we can ask very rapidly for high resolution CT scan. CD guidelines recommend, it's a recommendation, not a suggestion. Recommendation on the level of evidence 1C. To initiate immunosuppression with cyclophosphamide and corticosteroids plus plasmapheresis in all patients, in all patients with anti-GBM glomerulonephritis. So in all patients with anti-GBM antibodies or anti-GBM glomerulonephritis, we should start by cyclophosphamide steroids plasmapheresis. Except what are the exceptions? patients who are dialysis dependent at presentation, patients who have 100% decreasent in an adequate biopsy sample, and in patients who don't have pulmonary hemorrhage, these are the exceptions to initiate this aggressive regimen. In all patients, we should start by cyclosomide, steroid, and plasmapheresis, except in these conditions. Studies have shown that the mortality, and look at the numbers, mortality 
from anti GBM disease decreased from 47 to 8.5 percent from 47 to 8.5 percent with the use of plasma exchange and immunosuppression and five-year patient survival is currently over 90 percent with treatment the treatment for anti-gbm should be started as soon as possible this is very very important recovery and also look for the numbers recovery of the kidney function is only about five percent recovery is only about five percent in patients with crescent very high percent of crescent about 85 to 100 percent in kidney biopsy and in patient with oliguria and or advanced renal failure require or and dialysis dependent so in patients who are dialysis dependent or oliguric or have very high proportion of crescent the recovery of kidney function is only five percent very small number so in those patients the decision the decision to initiate therapy with our aggressive regimen should take the uh, should take in account this low chance of kidney recovery however the exception is when there is pulmonary hemorrhage if there is pulmonary hemorrhage if there is pulmonary hemorrhage even in these conditions we should use the aggressive regimen but if there is no pulmonary hemorrhage with these conditions dialysis dependent oliguria and very high crescent we should defer from this very aggressive regimen which include lasmapharesis cyclosomide and steroid due to the very low percentage of recovery again treatment should start without delay even before the diagnosis is confirmed plasma exchange should be continued until the anti-GBM titers are no longer detectable we should continue this is a very important practical point we should continue with plasma exchange until the titer is no longer detectable cycle of somite should be used for two to three months and the steroids should be used to about of six months so cycle of somite three months and the steroid for six months very important practical point this is a suggested algorithm from the key digo guidelines to how to deal with patient with rbgm patient with rbgm we should ask for a ct scan to diagnose if there is alveolar hemorrhage or not if the alveolar hemorrhage is absent in ct scan we should consider conservative approach we should consider conservative approach especially in patients who are oligoric as we said or dialysis dependent or very high proportion of crescent but if there if the alveolar hemorrhage is present and confirmed by the high resolution ct we should send serology for anti-gbm antibodies anca anti-nuclear antibody we should also exclude infection we should at presentation or within 24 hours we should obtain a kidney biopsy again we should ask for if there is rbgn and alveolar hemorrhage <coughs> at presentation we should we should send serology for anti-gbm antibodies anca anti-nuclear antibody we should exclude infection and we should do renal biopsy we should do renal biopsy if the data back to us within 24 hours confirming the anti-gbm disease we should treat as we said very urgently by steroids plasma exchange and cyclosomide if the data are not available or the results 
are not available within 24 hours, we should start treatment with steroids and plasma exchange until the data are back to us confirming the diagnosis of anti-GBM disease. We, should, we shouldn't delay the start of treatment if you are high, highly suspecting anti-GBM disease. If you confirm the diagnosis, we should, as we said, we start treatment by steroids, plasma exchange, and cyclosomide. We should monitor kidney function, pulmonary infiltrate, and GBM, anti-GBM antibody titter, and blood counts, and modify the treatment appropriately. This is a very nice algorithm to start or how to deal to a patient presented to you by RBGN and alveolar hemorrhage. These are the available options for treatment of good pasture disease, include plasma exchange, cyclophosphamide, and steroids. Now we'll talk about each one of them in details. We should start plasma exchange in a dose of 40 to 50 milli per kg ideal body weight daily. Take care of that daily by 5% albumin. We can give fresh frozen plasma at the end of the plasma exchange. If the patient have alveolar hemorrhage, we should use fresh frozen plasma. Again, plasma exchange or plasma pharesis in a dose of 40 to 50 milli per kg per day, and we use it daily. We can use 5% albumin, but if there is alveolar hemorrhage, we should use fresh frozen plasma. And if we use 5% uh, albumin, we should let the last 300 to 500 milli should be replaced by fresh frozen plasma. For how long? For how long this the duration of plasma exchange? We should do plasma exchange until the circulating anti-GBM antibodies are no longer detectable in the serum usually in about of 14 days. Cyclophosphamide in a dose of 2 to 3 milli per kg, 2 to 3 milligram, 2 to 3 milligram per kg orally, orally reduced to 2 milligram per kg in patients who are older than 50 year, 55 years of age, Cyclosmide is oral. The experience with the IV pulse cyclosmide is limited and the efficacy is uncertain. So most of the evidence is related to the oral cyclosomide in a dose of two to three milligram per kg. The dose of cyclosmide should be reduced in cases of leukopenia. In patients not tolerating or not responding to cyclosomide, we can use rituximab or mycophenolate mofetil. For how long we should give cyclosomide? Cyclosomide should be given for three months. Steroids should be used, of course, in the start as a pulse methyl prednisolone, one gram per day for three consecutive days, followed by prednisone for prednisolone one milligram per kg orally, reduced to 20 milligram per day by six weeks. Steroid should be used for six months. This is a very illustrative, descriptive for the treatment options of good pasture disease. A very nice slide from Comprehensive showing factors that favor the aggressive treatment and factors against aggressive treatment. We have said it before, but it's a very nice slide. Factors favoring aggressive treatment to use this aggressive regimen or the presence of pulmonary hemorrhage that there is no oliguria, that there is urine output in patient with creatinine less than 5.5 milligram per deciliter, 
in patient with creatinine more than 5.5 milligram per deciliter but with rapid and recent progression or have ANCA positive the glomerular affection or the crescent proportion on the biopsy are not not aggressive or not too much or if a patient having plan having a plan for early renal transplantation these conditions are favoring aggressive immunosuppression or aggressive regimen but factors against this aggressive aggressive regimen include if there is no pulmonary hemorrhage or if there is oliguria or there is deterioration in the kidney function with creatinine more than 5.5 milligram per deciliter and the patient is uh, anca negative or there is severe damage in the kidney biopsy in the form of a crescent more than 85 percent and if there is no desire for early kidney transplantation all of these factors are against aggressive therapy also this is a very practical slide in our practice and in the exams especially the european specialty examination there, there is no maintenance therapy there is no maintenance therapy for anti-gbn disease because relapses relapses of anti-gbn disease are very uncommon about zero to six percent of cases so relapses are very uncommon which causes that we don't recommend maintenance therapy for anti-gbn disease we should use only for the induction phase for about cyclosmide for six for three months and steroid for six months but smoking should be strongly discouraged again no maintenance therapy for anti-gbn disease but in patients with a double positivity, patients who are positive for anti-GBM and ANCA antibody, should, we should give them maintenance therapy. As we said before, these patients or these double positive patients usually react or act like vasculitis, so we should give them maintenance therapy. And about one third of patients with anti-GBM glomerulonephritis may be ANCA positive so it represents a considerable portion portion of patients with anti-gbm disease and again as we said that in these patients with a double positivity there is a greater chance of kidney recovery from dialysis dependent than in patient with only anti-gbm disease what about the refractory anti-gbm disease in refractory cases which is not common refractory anti-gbn disease is rare and represent about less than 10 percent in these refractory cases we can use rituximab we can use rituximab and th the experience with rituximab in anti-gbn disease is limited to only case reports also we can use mycophenolate mofetil instead of cyclophosphamide or in patient with uh, refusing cyclosomide or intolerant to cyclosomide due to toxicity we can use mycophenolate mofetil with a good results in several case reports so in this refractory case we can use rituximab or mycophenolate mofetil also there is a little hope with emlifidase which is igg degrading endopeptidase that leaves the human IgG into FC fragments and inhibits the anti antibody and the complement dependent cytotoxicity. So this emlifidase can degrade or cleaves the anti-GBM antibodies. And there is a good response in which have been used in three anti-GBM patients, but the recovery was wasn't complete 
but there is there was a response and there is a clinical trial now assessing the utility and safety of uh, emlifidase in anti-GBM disease also immunoabsorption can be an option to remove these antigen antibody if effectively can be used in with some good results in refractory cases which have caused dialysis dependency was successfully reversed in three out of six patients when using immunoabsorption but the first options in refractory cases remain rituximab and mycophenolate mofetil what about the kidney transplantation the option of transplantation in patients with anti-GBM disease reaching re renal failure transplantation should be postponed until the anti-GBM anti antibodies are no detectable are not detectable for at least six months this is very important again we should postpone transplantation until the antibodies are not detectable for at least six months why because the recurrence of anti-GBM disease after transplantation can can be very high approaching 50 percent in patients who perform transplantation with detectable anti-GBM antibodies while the recurrence of this of uh, the disease after transplantation is very low less than three percent in patients who have no antibodies at the time of transplantation so the recurrence will be very high if there is antibodies anti-gbm antibodies form usually occur in five to ten percent of patients with albert syndrome who perform kidney transplantation but over the disease is less frequent than that so the antibodies usually occur in five to ten percent but the the evident disease or the over disease is less frequent and if this if the disease is overt or clinical glomerulonephritis appear it usually starts very early unfortunately leads to graft loss again to perform transplantation we should wait until the antibodies are not detectable for at least six months these are our resources as usual thank you to meet in the next videos inshallah thank you